Hey, wow, it's so great to worship the Lord with you today. And all of you who are watching online, I hope you'll stay with us, grab a Bible. We're going to ultimately end up in John chapter 9. All right, so let's jump in. Everybody ready for this? Amen? Amen. You can talk to me. Come on. You're here, right? Let's go. All right, it's great to, to be with y'all. I'm so excited about the day. So Matthew O'Reilly is a, uh, an EMT. He's a critical care, um, you know, first responder type paramedic in New York. And he uh, talks about the fact that before uh, he really had been doing this for very long, he had already been trained to watch for a thing called impending doom. It's when a person expresses the fact that they might be dying or asking the question, like, am I dying? Like something you've never felt before, perhaps. And he said over and over through the years that he's done this for He's seen hundreds of people in the moment where they're dying. He's watched a lot of people die on a scene, or you can imagine, a heart attack or something else. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that. I've I've seen that. I've been in the room where people die right in front of me. I've watched people breathe their last breath. I've been with families around, you know, or I've talked with people even. Like, I know I've got a terminal illness, and the doctor has given me a few days or something like that. I'm going to make a call like that this week. I've been asked to come and visit with a man who says, my death is imminent. And, and what Matthew O'Reilly said was, for many years in the early part of his career, he would tell people when they look at him with this and say, am I dying? And he would lie to them. You know, you, like you see this in, in movies, like Save, Save in Private Ryan or something. Not today, not today. Come on, you're going to make it. You know, that kind of thing. And I'd be that way, right? I'd kinda, I'm kind of a hype man. No, you, you got this. You're going to do this. But he said what happened, all that changed until uh, one day, uh, when one day, a man who was in a motorcycle accident was severely injured, and he was critical, and he was dying. And he's laying there, and Matthew's looking at him, and eyeball to eyeball, as he'd seen a hundred times. He, he, he's, the guy says to him, he says, am I dying? And Matthew said, yes, you're dying. There's nothing more I can do for you. And he said, instead of, instead of this look of terror, the guy just laid his head back with a kind of resolve. And he said, a peace just came over it, like a surrender. And he said, from that day on, he would seek to be honest with people that he was watching die right before him. And, and as best he could, tell them the truth. And so what he learned, he saw three patterns Throughout all of his years doing this, he's continuing. He's still an EMT. And he, he said there's three patterns that he sees over and over again, people in their last moments when they're dying. He said the first one is a need for forgiveness. And I don't know where he is spiritually, but um, he, he said that regardless of religious background, regardless of your culture, ethnicity, it does not matter. Everybody, call it sin, call it guilt, call it remorse. He said every person in that moment n- n- want to know they're forgiven. And he said he was with a guy who had a massive heart attack, and he was dying. And before he was going to you know, try, to, try to help him, shock his heart back, he's, he's like, this guy's going. And the guy was saying to him, he said, I wish I had spent more time with my kids and my grandkids. I was so selfish with my time. And he was just like, can I be forgiven? He said the second thing that he, that he would see, this pattern would be this need for remembrance. That the person would be remembered. That their story actually mattered. Like when I die today... Will it even matter that I lived? Will anybody remember me? And he says over and over again, people would look at him as they're dying, and they would say, will you remember me? He says, yeah, I'll remember you, yes. We all want to know our story matters. He said the third thing was that our lives would have meaning and purpose. Every person, that their life mattered, that your story matters. He, he arrived on a scene where this woman in her late 50s had been T-boned at a high rate of speed at an intersection, and the firemen were there trying to get her out. She was pinned in the car. He got in the other side to render care, and he started talking to her as she's dying. And she says, I wish I'd done more for my kids. I have so much more to live for. And she went on to explain, I, I, she adopted two kids. Both were heading off to med school. And Matthew was like, are you kidding me? You gave two kids an opportunity they would have never had. And now they're going off to cheer, you know, to save lives and help other people. Every person, when we're dying, this is true of you and true of me, is there forgiveness? Does my story matter? Will I be remembered? And will my life have meaning? Or will I have wasted on things that do not matter? 
Listen here, I want to talk today about the fact that your story matters. Every life, every person here matters. We've been talking in this series, if you've been with us and if you're new, catch you up real quick. A simple acrostic that is really five missional practices that we're going to live out every single day of our lives. We are doing this. And we're seeking to win people to Jesus because that's the best thing we can do for others while we're still alive. And so we've said we begin with prayer, right? Start with prayer. And if you've been like me praying, Lord, open doors for me today. Bam! You're praying according to his will. It will happen. Your antennae will be up and you'll be going, I'm watching for the Lord. Just let me love somebody well. Begin with prayer. Listen to them. We need a lot more listening in our world today, a lot less talking, a lot more listening. Eat with them, right? Eat. And if you were here last, and that's, you know, share coffee. Sit down with people. Talk about their story, about their life. Get to know them. And we're praying for four people in our lives. And clearly, there's more than that. But we're praying specifically for people in our lives that we can bless. Last week, we looked at serve. Remember that? And we've talked about all kinds of ways that you can share the love of Jesus with people without using words. But is that all there is? St. Francis of Assisi is um, said to have uh, attributed to him to have said, preach the gospel. You ever heard this? And when necessary, what? Use words. Two things wrong with that. <laughs> First of all, do the research. He likely never said it. <laughs> Secondly, that's the problem. But I get it. The sentiment is awesome, right? Secondly, the gospel demands words. It's news. It's good news. News needs a newscaster. Nobody's ever watched me serve them with my best abilities, like serving somebody, and then they go, wow, I've been separated from God because he's holy, and I'm sinful. In fact, it's a condition of my heart. I can't rescue myself. And, And Christ had to come, incarnate. God in the flesh comes. He lives the perfect life for me because I couldn't. My substitute, he crushes all of the demands of the law, lives it out perfectly for me. He dies on the cross as the perfect lamb of God to take away my sin. He's my substitute. He dies the death. I should have died. He takes on my punishment, the wrath of God upon him. He's buried. He's raised again so that I could have eternal life proving that he's the son of God, and then now I can be, live this resurrected life. And someday when I die, I don't die, but I'm living forever. Jeff, you're so amazing. I need to receive Christ. Nobody's done that. Nobody will ever do that because the, the good news needs messengers. And today we're going to talk about the fact that your story matters. Every story matters. And here's what's cool today. You know, you're like, well, Jeff, you know, it's kind of awkward for me. I don't know how to enter spiritual conversation. Okay, this is what we're talking about. This is the way of Jesus. It's simple. Some of us have been trained, like, you know, well, memorize these 10 verses to share this poem and then ask them these three questions. Like, what? No. No, you have a story. Let me ask you this. And everybody watching me online, how many of you have come to a point in your life where you've received Christ? Okay, I'm not going to assume this is everybody. You've come to Christ, and you know that you know that you know that you're going to be saved, I mean, that you are saved, and that you're going to go to heaven when you die. How many of you have come to that point in your life? Raise your hand, if you don't mind. Just be bold. You know, others of you, maybe not. Okay. You can put them down. If you have come to Christ, you have a story to tell, and everybody needs to hear your story. Because today we're going to see that your story matters because your life matters. Your story matters because your brokenness matters. And your story matters because your redemption matters. And ultimately, what I want to do today is all of us to leave to say, everybody in my life matters. And I need to share the story of the gospel, what he's done in my life. And, and yet we have a problem. We got a challenge. And I got, I got to address the challenge. We noted that there are, again, a lot of ways to, to tell people of, or, or how about uh, express God's love to people without using words. But that's where most of us end, without words. And Barna Research did this incredible project with the Alpha Group. It's a massive research that they did among believers. And and what they learned was this. 96% of all Christians, see if you resonate with this, almost 100%, part of my faith means being a witness for Jesus. Okay, if you read the Bible at all, you got a sense he's pretty explicit about this. It's the Great Commission. It's why we exist as a church. 
That's why we do everything, as Corey noted earlier. And, and, and so 96% said the best thing that could happen to a person is for them to come to know Jesus. The best thing is what nine, almost 100% of us would say. And then watch this. 28% of all Christians, 46% of those in their 20s and 30s agree that it's wrong to tell someone else about uh, Jesus if they kind of follow a different faith or have different beliefs. What? The best thing. But maybe not. Where's the disconnect? What is happening here? And then here's what happens. We bemoan the fact that our entire culture, our nation, is southbound and going completely secular. Everybody's lost. So we watch the news. These crazy people, those progressives are out of their minds. Those conservatives, how crazy are they? Those unbelievers, those sinners. Listen, sinners sin because it's their job description. Like us. Now, I'm not a sinner. We'll talk about this. I'm a saint before God Almighty because I've come to Christ. But I still fall into sin. And we sin when we disobey him. But we bemoan the culture. We talk about everybody, you know, everybody's going crazy. And yet we're not sharing our story. Jesus was very clear about this. We have good news and we're supposed to share it. So I'm glad that you're here today because I'm going to set you free. I'm going to set you free to live the most adventurous life possible. It's fun to wake up and go, God, what you got for me today? Whoever you bring to me, right here in front of me, I'm going to be faithful because you've been faithful to me. So let's look at John 9. We're going to look at a story, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Of uh, You'll know him as the blind man. He's the blind beggar, and um, uh, he doesn't have a name, and yet we'll see that his life matters. So I'm going to give him a name. Um, let, I'm going to call him Seymour, okay? Kind of a fun name um, because... Once he came to Jesus, he could see more. All right, thank you. Um, all right, dad joke. Let's go. Um, so he could see more. We're going to name him because he's got, this guy mattered. But here's what we're going to see. In chapter 8, okay, put this in context. The Pharisees are coming after Jesus. I mean, he's creating a stir. And it's funny. They, they catch him at some point. This has happened to me so many times where, where they'll go, um, here's what they do. They say, you're, you're a Samaritan, right? Like they label him as this outcast. You're a Samaritan and you're demon possessed. Are we right about this? Because everybody wants to label you, right? Because they can't figure you out. Because the gospel is always the third way. Jeff, you're liberal, right? I mean, you're, you're all about, you know, you're always talking about racism and all this stuff. You're liberal, right? No. No. Well, you, you know, you're, you're all about how, um, you know, every life matters and, and, and even life before, uh, you, you know, babies are born and, and then all, you're, you're conservative, right? That's what you are. You're, you're always talking about the gospel. You're always talking about the truth and you tend to, see, people try to label us and if that's happening, friends, join the club because the gospel is always the third way and Jesus would not be labeled and he's like, nope. Not demon possessed, thank you very much. Nope, not a Samaritan, not a Pharisee, not that, not that. I'm nobody's boy, and I'm not your boy. I am the Son of God. And so they said, so he says to them, he says, and it's in the latter part of chapter nine, chapter eight. He says, anyone who believes, uh, you know, my word will will live forever, will not die. And they go, wait, 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 whoa, wait. Abraham, Father Abraham died, you're claiming like you're better than Abraham. And he said, hey, here's the thing. Before Abraham was born, I am. He says, I'm the transcendent one outside of time. I am the name of God. And, and some, some people have challenged me to say, you know, Jeff, um, Jesus never really was explicit about saying that he was God in the flesh. I mean, he didn't really say that. He's like a lot aligned with the purpose of God. Okay, the next verse, verse 59, I think it is. They picked up stones in order to kill him. His first hearers knew exactly what he was saying. So don't give us any of this stuff that Jesus never was explicit about. The fact that he's God in the flesh, that's what put him on the cross. Ultimately, our sins put him on the cross, right? But here's what we're going to see here. Real simple. Sermon within a sermon. This is the practical piece. I mean, you could guess this. So I'm going with a different outline here today. But we see it here. Life before we come to Christ. This is how you share your story. All right? Write this one down. Life before you come to Christ, how you came to Christ, 
In that is the gospel story in the middle of that. And you know it. If you have received Christ, you know the gospel story. And then since you've come to Christ, that's how you tell your story. All right? But before we go, I want us to look at this guy's story and how we're going to see here that your story matters because here it is, your life matters. Every single life matters. Your story matters because you matter. And I want you to look at verse 1 in chapter 9. Here we go. As he passed by, Jesus passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now watch this. He saw him. Jesus sees him. And his disciples, he saw the man, all right? His disciples see a theological problem. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Now, two things here. In ancient Israel, he would have been ostracized because he's blind. And so he's a beggar. I mean, he was marginalized. He probably had come to believe this about him, that I'm nobody. My story does not matter. And also aligning with ancient Judaism, uh, the, the, the theology was that if you suffered in some way, then you must have sinned. We see this all the way back to the book of Job and all his friends who aren't, aren't real helpful. And so they're saying, who sinned, this man or his parents? Somebody did. And this was well-intentioned because what they were trying to do theologically is to say, God is not responsible for all this evil and suffering in the world. So what's going on over here? Let's don't blame God. And then Jesus, um, he, he steps in and, and he says, okay, this is not exactly what's going on, as we'll see here in a moment. But look at this. See more, okay? Be, because he's, he's this man who cannot see, he surely has come to believe that my story doesn't matter. Now, here's the problem. We do the same. I want to pause for a moment here because I tend to do this. I drive up to it. It happened to me recently. Um, homeless guy. My first thought is, wow, I wonder what, wonder, what, wonder what his story is. But too often I'm like, bro, get a job. I mean, what's your thing? What's going on? See, we all can tend to do this. We see someone in need, and Jesus never did this, by the way. Why are you blind? What? Why are you homeless? What? What are you, lazy? Why are you in this condition? We do the same. You must have done something to end up here when we don't know their story. Why are there hundreds of kids now in the convention center, migrant Kids who left their families, how tragic is this? At the border, immediately, what's up with our government? What's the deal? Why are they here? Somebody figure this out. We do the same thing. And when I started thinking that this week, I got on the phone, I started email. What we ought to be asking is, well, how can we help? How can we serve them? Because Jesus saw this man. Jesus sees every life, every teenage boy who's been separated from his family at the border. Regardless of policy, it's a complicated issue. So I'm hearing from Rolando Aguirre. We're asking Spanish-speaking people in our congregation to help volunteer. They don't need a lot of stuff. They, they don't, don't be sending all your clothes and then feel good about it. Sometimes that's appropriate, but we, they don't need stuff. They need people just to come and serve. Now, the Catholic Charities are doing a great job. We're, we're entering in and asking questions. How can, we sell, how can we serve? The question, my point is, it's not why. What is going on here? It's how can we serve them? That's what Jesus is doing here. It was Diedrich Bonhoeffer who said, keep on asking questions, and it will eliminate your need for obedience. And that's what we, we do. They got a little theological thing going on. And, and listen, his, his story matters. Your life matters. And then secondly, I want you to see your life matters. Your story matters because, because your brokenness matters. See, God never wastes a hurt. He always uses our struggles. Even Here's what's crazy. Even the things that we bring on ourselves. All of the, the failure that we've had in our past. All of our sin. God flips it around, as we're going to see here, and he does it in your life. Only God can do that. To take our brokenness and turn it around. So Jesus is going to say, hey, there's no, there's no blame here. Jesus answers the question theologically, by the way. And Jesus said, there's no karma here. This is not karma. He didn't say that. I, I said that. But look at verse 3. Here's what he says. Jesus answered. It was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Jesus is saying, 
This man has gone through a struggle. He has experienced great suffering, but for a purpose. Listen, there's potential in your pain. Here's what happens. Your pain, your suffering, even your bad mistakes and all that you've done in your life is simply your setback. Watch this. Your setback is a setup for God. Every setback in your life is a setup for God to show himself great. And what we see here is that this man is going to be healed. If you know the story, this is what's happening. But some of y'all recognize this night is coming. Anybody? Night cometh. Anybody know where this is? Where is it? It's on our clock. It's on our clock tower, seen by thousands of people, if you will look. And it says the clock is ticking, night cometh, and it drives one of our core values as a church. We're running out of time. Every one of us are going to die. And some people know in the moment, that last minute, I think I'm dying. Many of us don't. And we're to tell our story, to live the story of the gospel and his change in our life before we run out of time. We live with relentless urgency because we have today, right? It was Maya Angelou who said, there's no greater agony than bearing your untold story inside of you. Now, that can be a lot of pain, you know? And, and what happens when we share our story, it releases that pain. It releases its power over you. This is the power of confession. That we, we just share our, our junk. I'm messed up. And, and because here's the thing. You're only as sick as your secrets. And when you share your sin, it starts to unleash the power over you. And then the same way when you tell our story, there's appropriate place and, and opportunities to do all this. But, you know, oftentimes we need to talk about where we were because sin is universal. Talk about what we wrestled with in the past and how God's released us and is releasing us from the sin in our past and from, from all that we've gone through. But there's potential in your, plane, in your, in your pain. Your, 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 your set back is a set up. For God, look at verse 6. Having said these things, this is strange, he spit on the ground and made, a, made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes, anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. I love that. Okay, there's, we can hang out there for a while. So he went and washed and came back seeing. See again, sometimes your setback is a setup. All the while, God was going to use this man's brokenness, his, his suffering for his good. So your brokenness matters because then God's glory is on display. Well, then what happens, and we won't do, go through all the verses, but what happens from verse 8 uh, to, to, to verse uh, 24, you can look at it real quick with me because you see his neighbors come up and they're like, wait, is this the guy? I don't think it's, it's really, this is a great story. I love it. It's kind of funny. Uh, in the midst of it, because they can't figure... We would have done the same. They can't figure out what's happened. Is that the blind guy? Surely not, because now this guy sees. Can't be the same guy. Looks like him. Not him. And they're like, no, I think it's him. And then they bring, bring him before the Pharisees. Like, hey, tell these guys what happened, and who did this to you, by the way? So, well, I think, I don't know, this guy, I'm not sure where he is. Jesus is gone. And so they're going, you tell us, man, who do you think this guy was? He says, uh, he's a prophet. Um, because how, how could this happen, you know, right? And so they bring him, and he kept saying, I'm the man. He kept, he kept saying, I'm the guy. I'm that guy. Like, are you the guy? And then finally they bring his parents in. And his, like, they bring the parents before the Pharisees. Like, is this your son? Like, was he born blind for real? They're like, we know, we know our son. He was born blind. He's been suffering all his life. Yes, that's our son. But then they even, because they thought they were going to get thrown out of the synagogue, they then go, hey, you know what? He's of age. Talk to him. Ask him what's going on. And so they then bring him before the Pharisees, right? And then it says this. He says, he answered them. Like, what happened to you? Do what, you think this guy's a prophet? Who is this guy who healed you? Because they're after Jesus. And he answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. See, this this is the power of the story. This man had no theological explanation of it all. He didn't have a commentary. He didn't, he was, you know, he, all he knew was that I was blind, now I can see. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. 
And even if we fumble through, you know, I don't know exactly what Jesus, I'm afraid you're going to ask me a question. I don't know all the theological answers. I'll send you to my pastor because I think you went to seminary. You might know somebody. I don't, no, no, no. No, you have a story. And the beauty of your story is nobody can argue with it. All they can do is this. They can say, that's awesome, but that's not my story. Okay, this is my story. And you can't take away my story. This is the power of your story and why your story matters so much. You have power in your story. And then what happens is, uh, and let me, let me just say this, there's more than just your story. And here's the point here. He didn't have just a story. He has a new life. Now you can say, well, yeah, if I was blind, then I could see I'd have a story. I'd have quite a story. No, 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 listen. We're all born in sin. We're all spiritually blind. Christ saves us, we have a story to tell. Amen? Because at the end of it all, it's not our story. We're not the hero of the story. Christ is. We're going to talk about this next week a lot more. I'm going to talk about it a bit before we close. But here's the thing. Uh, Every story matters. And, And this guy, his story matters because Christ has changed his life, right? And what I love about this guy's story is that that he has more of a more than a story, and we do too. You have a changed life. Or do you? Are you living differently than everybody else at the office? Are you living different? Everybody at your school goes, that, that student's different. That person on our team's different. You've got more than a story. You've got a life that looks like Jesus. And so they go on from verses 26 to 33. Um, they're like, hey, what did he do for you? Where is this guy? And then this, this is what I love. The blind man starts to get a little snarky. Because, I mean, he was just a blind beggar, right? Begging people. And, and now... He's like, hey, um, you guys are looking for him. You guys, y'all want to, y'all want y'all want to become disciples now? What, what's your deal? We all want to, you know. They're getting all a little, little angry with him now because now here's what's happening. I think he he now has authority. He has authority because he has a story. When he didn't before, he had no authority. He had nothing to tell except I'm blind, I can't see, I need money or whatever he needed. And now he's got a story to tell, and the same is true for us. The moment Christ comes into your life, changes your life, you have been given authority by him and by the power of his spirit. And so here's what happens, though. He starts to tell them, I'm certain about this. And then he says, you guys want to become his disciple? What's the deal? And then he says in verse 34, see it there. You are born in utter sin, and you, this is what they're saying to him, and you would teach us? Again, back to, you're a sinner, you blind man. And they cast him out. They threw him away. They couldn't handle the miracle, and they tossed him out. Can you imagine? A church that cannot handle a miracle can't figure it out theologically, so they send him out. It never happened here. And again, as if they were born without sin, like without other sin. Look, you and I have been born in utter sin. So your story matters because you matter. Your life matters. Your story matters because your brokenness matters. And watch this. Your story matters because your redemption matters. And I say redemption, and I mean, you know, it it includes your salvation, but here's what I mean. God redeems everything. He buys everything back and makes it more beautiful than it was before. He redeems, and he redeems, and he redeems, and that's what he does. And so your redemption matters, right? Because your life matters, and he's changed you into something beautiful. Look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. Watch this. Jesus doesn't let him go. He shows up again. I love this. Jesus will not let you go. He comes back around, and he heard that they'd cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have, look at this, you have seen him, and it is he who's speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe And he worshiped him. Something that was only to be given to God alone. I believe, I I never caught this before. This is the moment of his conversion. Imagine that. Jesus heals people before they truly know who he is. So that they would come to him. And that's what happens here. I mean, mean, in verse 7, he tells him to go to the pool of Siloam. There's an act of faith. So he's like, okay, I'm out. I got mud on my eyes. I got to go wash it off anyway. But it's kind of this, like, maybe there, maybe, you know, who knows. But it seems here, he says, now I believe, and he's worshiping Jesus. 
And then now, watch this, the setback becomes a setup for Jesus to say this. Look at verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world. Look at that, wait, wow, wait, what? For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. What? Look, he's saying there's something worse than physical blindness. Spiritual blindness. Some of the Pharisees who were nearby, they, they said to him, hey, are we blind? Are you talking about us? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. This is the moral of the story, if you will. There's, there's a sin that is spiritual blindness that will not say, you know what? I need a savior. Watch this. The only qualification to your salvation is to confess that you don't qualify. That's it. The only thing that you bring to the table is your sin. And the only thing keeping you from salvation is for you to say, I cannot see, I'm blind, I need rescue. And if you've not done that today, friend, today is your day for your life to be changed. Because this man finally had an authority that he did not have before because his identity has been changed. He's no longer the blind beggar. He's now Seymour, child of God, son of the living God. That's the primary storyline in your life. And it's the storyline in my life. I say it this way. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm an uncle. I'm a friend. I'm a pastor. None of those things are the truest thing about me. Because any one of those things, God forbid, could be taken away from me today. Then who am I? I am a beloved son of the most high king. That's who I am. And it's who you are if you have received him. We can go forth today with the story of our salvation. Here's what happens. Nowadays, everybody thinks they've got to have a dramatic story. I'm like, well, you know, I never run drugs and I, wasn't, I don't have much of a story. I've had people tell me, I've got a boring testimony. What? If you think you were kind of good, Jesus made you a little better, and you get to go to heaven when you die, that's a boring story. And it's not the gospel. The Bible says that we were dead in our sins before we came to Christ. We're sons and daughters of disobedience. That we can't do anything to rescue ourselves. Jesus intervenes, and he comes to rescue us from our sin so that we can have life in him finally we, we, he breathes into us so that we're actually living. We can see now. We can see our brokenness and we can see the world as it is. There's nothing boring about that. Nothing boring about that. I came to Christ when I was nine years old. Praise be to God. I had godly parents speaking into my life. And over and over again, I've seen uh, this grace awakening in my life to see that, that I now know. And he's changing my life every single day. Look, your life matters. Your story matters because your life matters. Your story matters because your brokenness matters. God never wastes a pain. Your story matters because your redemption matters. He buys you back and makes you more beautiful than you were before or ever could be. And your story matters. Here it is. Because everyone in your life matters. Every person in your life. And so the message is not us, right? We're not the hero of our story. This guy, like the blind man, all right? All I know, I was blind, now I see. All I know, I was lost, now I am a child of the Most High King. This is why 1 Corinthians 1 is our message. We join Paul. He said it this way, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ and him crucified. I've said it this way before. Our message is not humanity and it improved. It's Christ and him crucified. We're not the hero of the story. He said a stumbling block to the Jews, folly to the Gentiles, but to those of us who are called, both Jews and Greeks, all of us, anyone, male and female, black and white, can I say it? Asian people matter to God. All people matter to God, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Oftentimes we hear it this way. Progressives, you know, Jews and Greeks, and progressives, they, they, they seek compassion without truth and conviction oftentimes. 
Conservatives often seek uh, truth and conviction, oftentimes without compassion. And both are looking for the autonomous self, for freedom, to live their own lives as they want to. We preach Christ and him crucified. He is the only way, and he's always the third way. The gospel is what changes our lives, and Jesus Christ has come. And so our testimony is this. Look at this. May it be said of us, any of you, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. That's all I've got. I was blind, and now I can see because of Jesus. And friend, if you have come to Jesus like that, then you've got a story to tell. So Matthew O'Reilly says that there's three things that every dying person needs. This desire for forgiveness, the need for remembrance, and the need for meaning. And we find them all in Jesus Christ. All are met in him and nowhere else. And so right now, we're going to close our eyes and just bow our heads And we're going to finish our service today in a really special way. Just to pause and reflect. Not to run out, to rush out to something you think might be more important. Just a few minutes, we're going to stop and just reflect. I want you to reflect on your life. We sang about how good he is to us. How good he's been to you. But I want you to think about your life now. When you die. When that day's coming, if he doesn't come first. But on the day you die. What will you want your story to be? And if you've never received Christ, today is your day. Say, yes, Jesus, come into my heart now. Rescue me from my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. I believe I worship you with my life. Friends, we have today. Your story matters. What will be the story told of your life off into eternity?